So this, I'm mostly going to speak about this work together with Tom Tro uh, Trogdon, who is now at Irvine, uh, Goblin Menon at Brown, and she and Oliver, he's now moved to England. He's, I think, at uh, Imperial. Okay. So uh, the origin of this work was the following is that there are two structures on matrices which have integrability. The first is ran random matrix theory. And we know that interesting st statistics for ran random matrix theory, like the gap prob probability or the largest eigenvalue distribution, they're all expressed in terms of functions which are themselves solutions of, complete, of classically completely integrable Hamiltonian systems. So that's where the integrability in ra random matrix theory lies. The other integrability is for eigenvalue al algorithms. Perhaps it's a little less well known, but um, the standard eigenvalue al algorithms are themselves classical integrable systems in a way which I'll describe a little bit later. So the thought that we had in mind was what happens if you marry these two integrabilities, or you try to, and the natural arena then is to look at the computation of eigenvalues of random matrices. And when we began in investigating this, we came upon what we believe is a new phenomenon, which I will speak about to today. Today, all my uh, com comments will be about new numerical experiments where we see uh, this new phenomenon and next week I will take one of these al algorithms and actually show analytically that this phenomenon is real. Okay, so, so in earlier work, this work sta started a little bit before 2012, uh, together with Govan Menon and Christian Frung, who was a P PhD student at Brown, Govan Menon is Brown, we considered the problem of computing the eigenvalues of real n by n random symmetric matrices. So the matrices will be chosen from different ensembles using different algorithms. So E is always on, refers to ensemble, and A refers to an algorithm. So SN are the n by n real symmetric matrices. <coughs> Now, if you go to Lin, LinPack or any other standard uh, uh, eigenvalue pa package, the most, in mo most cases, the algorithm you will find will be based on the following very elegant idea. Uh, standard algorithms utilize maps. So there's a map, phi, which depends on the algorithm A, which is characteristic of the algorithm A, which is isospectral. So if you act on a matrix M, you get a new matrix, phi sub AM, which has the same spectrum as M. Then you consider a iteration. You start off with some matrix M0 equals M, the matrix whose eigenvalues you want. And you look at this iteration, MK plus 1 equals phi AMK. There's clearly all these matrices MK have the same spe uh, spectrum. And as K becomes large, MK goes to a di diagonal matrix. So it follows necessarily that the lambda i's are the desired eigenvalues of the matrix M. Very elegant thought. So in our paper, paper, we discovered the following phenomenon, and that's what I was speaking about. So for a given accuracy epsilon, and given matrix size n, now epsilon and n should, epsilon should be small, n should be large, and there's going to be a scaling region in which the phenomenon I'm speaking about hold true. And a given algorithm A, the fluctuations in time to compute the eigenvalues to accuracy epsilon with a given algorithm A were universal, independent of the choice of ensemble. So the universality is concerns what choice you make of the ensemble. Well, you have a limited choice of ensemble, but you're not looking at all possible ensembles. Uh, we're dealing with a finite. <laughs> Uh, finite operations, right? I mean, there are infinite number of possible ensembles, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. You, if you took something with a tri diagonal or something localized, you'd get different. No, systems. no, not uh, if you put the right ensemble on, on, on it, it's going to. Uh, so, that 
if you, so there'll be different uni universality classes. So, within, yeah, yeah, so sure, there'll be certainly limits on the kind, you're right, there'll be yeah, some limits. Yeah, no, yeah. For, uh, for example, if the ensembles were consist of di di diagonal matrices, <laughs> we are dead then, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you, so you have to have it. You, 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 yeah, you so, okay. okay. So, for a very broad <laughs> range of ensembles, we see. And there will be other universality cl clouds connected with different broad range of ensembles. But the, the phenomenon will always be not limited to one particular ensemble. There will always be a universality class. That's, that's, an accurate, that's a more accurate sta statement. OK, so more, more precisely, let me go back. Uh, Con consider the following. Suppose you take a matrix M, M is of size N by N, and suppose it has a block form. So this is K, K by K, this is N minus K by N minus K, and this is K by N minus K. We say that if we have a matrix M, this matrix here, obtained by dropping the off diagonal elements, is, is obtained from M by deflation. Now, clearly, if the size of the off diagonal ent ent entries here are less than epsilon, then the eigenvalues lambda i of m will differ from the eigenvalues of this matrix by order epsilon. Now, it's a very common thing. You, you, you don't mean that the m11s one are the same as the m11s? Exactly the same. You just the drop the off diagonal entries. That process is known as deflation. You just drop the off diagonal You just drop them. And then by simple per perturbation theory, right, if the off diagonal entries are less than epsilon, uh -huh. then the eigenvalues of this matrix and the eigenvalues of this matrix differ by order epsilon. Oh, if, if, if the oscillator. Okay. And the way algorithms work is that you run until you find some k by k block form, form where the off diagonal entries are le less than epsilon. And then you just throw away the off diagonal entries, and then you consider these two, two matrices, M11 and M, and you start the algorithm again. And you keep, keep going in this way, working with smaller and small, uh, smaller matrices, and that's the way which you, you work efficiently. So this is the, the algorithm with uh, deflation. Could, could I ask, when you do this deflation, yeah. You, you've written it as an n by k, in sort of principle n by k. Principle. You could imagine, you could imagine doing it, you mm. know, with some other. You could certainly imagine. Like you you could. Do that, yeah. right? Standard algorithms don't do that. Okay. To to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Okay. So here is a key object. So let t, which will depend on epsilon, it's the desired accuracy. N is the size size of the matrices. A is the algorithm you choose, and E is the ensemble from which matrices M are chosen. And T is the number of steps, or the time, or the number of iterations that it takes to deflate a random matrix M chosen from the ensemble B to order epsilon using algorithm A. That is, T is the smallest time, or such so that for some K, for some K, the off diagonal entries are less than epsilon. So you run it until you look at all possible blocks of these forms. And if one of them has the proper pro pro the off diagonal entries are less than epsilon, that is your time. And what we look at is this normalized time, which is the fl fluctuation. So for any matrix M, this is the time. And then what you do is you take maybe 5, 10, 10,000 matrices, all chosen from the ensemble E. You find the times, and you take the average. It's a sample average, and you divide by the sample standard deviation. And uh, then you ref record the information for this particular object in terms of a histogram. You get a histogram for them. And what you find is the following for the following for perhaps the most famous eigenvalue algorithm of all, the so-called QR algorithm. And the QR algorithm works in the following way. You've got a matrix M, and you factor it as Q times R, where Q is an orthogonal matrix, and R is an upper tri triangular matrix with positive entries. 
So then what is your phi A or phi QR? That's just obtained by interchanging QR with RQ. And you see if you solve for R from this equation, R equals Q transpose M, you plug it in here, you see that this is an isospectral action. Now, what you're looking at over here are uh, results for running this algorithm with two different ensembles. And you, uh, ah, keep going back. Can't get this right. So what you're looking at uh, over here are 40 histograms. Now, what are these 40 histograms? They're all for the Q QR algorithm. And they're all for choices of matrices from GOE, the Gaussian or, or orthogonal sum. The 40 histograms obtained for different values of epsilon, four, four, four of them, two, four, six, eight, and n, the size of the matrices, go over 10, 30, up to 1, 9. Then. So 20 of n's and 4k, so you've got 40 histograms, one on top of the other. This is the normalized um, uh, time to obtain accuracy epsilon. Then this quant quantity here is what you get if instead of choosing your matrices from GOE, you do exactly the same thing for Bernoulli matrices, so plus or minus one. So these, as we all know, are extremely different kind, kinds of ensembles. One is purely discrete and the other is as smooth as you can ever get. Then you put these 40 and these 40 over here and you get this picture over here. Are you just superimposed on that? Just paste, you've got to two and you paste the one on top of the other. So you see the universality here coming out. Uh, you know, uh, there's really a sc scaling region. As k is getting la large and n is get get getting large, you're getting more and more into the scaling regime. So if I only inclu included k equals 8 and n equals 190, it would be a much sharp, a sharper curve. K you is the size of the block? Or the no, here k is just given, k is just here. Epsilon equals 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6. It's got nothing to do with other k. Oh, well, that's what I was saying. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. It's just this k. So it's just the epsilon. Yeah, it's just the epsilon. It's the scaling regime. So when epsilon is sufficiently small and n is sufficiently large, but there has to be a relationship be between them. I'm not saying what that oh, relationship is yet, okay. but you'll see when I uh, give the talk on. To on Windsor, I will say exactly what that uh, scale scaling re region is. There is a scale scaling region, and you get more and more into that scale scaling re re region as you. It will it, become clear, clearer as we go, go on. So, at least from a visual point of view, you begin to see the. Okay. So, here are G GOE, if you haven't seen, uh, seen it be, be before, just Gaussian I I IID, mean zero, variance one. Bernoulli is uh, matrices n by n matrices, plus or minus 1 over root n. Okay, here's just to show you again the same, the same picture. And now, okay, so what we saw in the initial cal calculations is this phenomenon beginning to come out. All the experiments, or most of them, were done with real symmetric matrices with different ensembles. I've just shown two, uh, two ensembles, but we looked at many different ensembles. So then we began trying to in investigate the phenomenon in a more systematic way. And this is what we did. We looked at a different, a, a different al algorithm, the Jacobi algorithm, which has a completely different char uh, character. Then we looked at ensembles with dependent entries. All the examples I mentioned so far had independent entries. Maybe that was a factor. Then we began to switch on to, okay, so we began to believe this phenomenon is present for eigenvalue com co computation. Maybe the phenomenon is also present in other numerical com uh, computations. So we began to look at the conjugate gra gradient al al algorithm, which is connected with solving linear equations, Ax equals b. A and B are random. Then uh, Jim Reds is also a similar al algorithm to the con conjugate gradient, again solving Ax equals b. In, um, uh, in other si situations. At this point, we were more or less under beginning to collect evidence that the phenomenon was pre uh, present in many, many numerical cal calculations con connected with finite dimensional systems. 
The next step was to see whether this phenomenon is also present in infinite dimensional situations. If you try to solve some infinite dimensional pro 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 problem, and that's how we'll speak about it, and we will show how to solve uh, the Dirichlet pro pro problem in a random region. Then, at this point, we said all the algorithms we've looked at over here are really uh, dynamical systems, de de deterministic dy dynamical systems, but with random initial data. What happens if the algorithm itself is sto <coughs> stochastic? And that's when we looked at the genetic algorithm. And finally, we looked at a de de decision-making model, which I'll say more about later on. Okay, so the first... Well, my favorite algorithm. Okay, your fa uh, favorite al uh, algorithm. So, you suppose you've got a matrix in, in, in SN, and you choose an IJ entry where MIJ is bigger or equal to all the other entries in, in the matrix. Then you define Gij to be the matrix with cosine here, cosine here, minus sine here, mi minus sine, here, and this is in the Ij position, Iijj. And you choose the angle in sine, sine theta in exactly the way that is such a way that when you conjugate this, conjugate M by so, uh, such a way, this entry goes to zero. So you take the biggest entry and just make it zero. To, uh, to choose epsilon. And then you run it. And quite remarkably, this algorithm con converges. And uh, we let T epsilon N A E denote the halting time. Uh, so in, in, in place of that, we use K. So epsilon is the accuracy you want. N is the size, size of the matrices. A is the algorithm, which in our case is the Jacobi algorithm here. And epsilon are going to be different um, on, on, on sums. And k is the number of iterations it takes for the Jacobi algorithm to reduce the Frobenius norm, in other words, the sum of the squares of the off diagonal en entries, to be less than the given epsilon. This is sufficient to conclude that at least <coughs> one eigenvalue on the diagonal of the transformed matrix is with an epsilon of an exact eigenvalue of the original matrix. In fact, all, all the eigenvalues be, will, will be with an epsilon times n, but let's leave that aside. So once again, we construct the fl fluctuation. So for given epsilon n, A is our Jacobi algorithm, E is the ensemble, we take maybe 15,000 matrices M, and we compute the sample average, and we t divide it by the sample sta standard deviation. So it's always the, fl the fluctuation. You're, you're, you're taking all, you're asking for all the, you're asking for the the off all the off diagonal. It's a little, little mm -hmm. different from what you had last time. It's a different algorithm, completely different. Algorithm different. different. Everything's, different. Everything's different. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole idea is to try and look at many different situations yeah. to see if the phenomenon is present. So, here I'm recording just for two very different kinds of on, on, ensembles. So, what you're seeing here, you're seeing the observation for this, the, the histogram for tau. When A is the Jacobi algorithm, E is either GOE or Bernoulli. So either the entries of the matrix are GOE or they are plus or minus 1 over root, root n. And epsilon is given in this particular quan uh, quantity over here. And the left displays two, two histograms, one for GOE, one for Ber Bernoulli. And you see beginning to sit one on top of the other. And now we increase the matrix size to nine, 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 90, and you see it beginning to be much sharper around here. So you're beginning to enter this region, which we say is a sc scaling region in which this phenomenon can, uh, can be seen. OK, so here's the two, two ensembles, just to remind you, GOE and Bernoulli. And here's the picture again. I assume that's a Gaussian. What? No. Huh? No. What is it? Looks uh, like a Gaussian. Don't know. <laughs> doesn't look like crazy. Gaussian-like. OK. So at this point, we had looked at different al algorithms, but with ensembles of matrices, which are the entries are in independent. So, so now. Numerics, right? 
it's all numerics to them. And those are all being killed. There are no banned <laughs> agencies or anything like that. Yeah, uh, well, so confident there's not Gaussian. Well, well yeah, the, we see Based many on different ones. So, okay, look at this one over here. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It looked more, 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 but I doubt very much whether it's ga Gaussian silk. Okay, so now uh, we began to say, well, so far all the numerics we, we, we have done have been with independent en entries. So we began to say maybe if you have dependent entries, the situation will change. Now, there, so we looked at. Now, instead of real symmetric matrices, we looked at Hermitian matrices. And we looked at the uh, Hermitian ma ma matrices with the unitary invariant ensembles of the following form, e to the minus n trace of Vm times dm. So dm is the big measure on the algebraically independent entries of m. And Vx grows uh, uh, when x gets large. And uh, of course, the entries are independent if and only if V is proportional to X squared, that's GUE, and it's a very right. non-trivial matter, and it's a whole other di discussion how you sam sample matrices with de dependent entries. Uh -huh. It's a very interesting business. You can use Dyson Brown, Brown, Brownian motion to do that, if it's done by Menon and a student of it or, or, or a collaborator of his, but just for mission case, Alva and and Trogdon have worked out a very, very beautiful algorithm which uses the or orthogonal polynomials associated with that, but I'm not going to speak about it. It's a very interesting and non-trivial so problem. That takes a certain amount of time, too, depending upon the size of the matrix, right? Sure, but yeah. that's yeah. good to you, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's that's good. Interesting it, it's topic. an interesting topic in its own right. It's a very beautiful algorithm. It's really worth looking at. Um, now, here you see that what you have done, uh, we have again, we're taking the QQI algorithm, and we're taking on sums for three different choices of V, and I'll say what they are. One we call QE, cosh H, and GUE. Epsilon is 10, 10 to the minus 10. So sitting here are three histograms, one for each of these three cho choices of E. And again, you have here three histograms, one, one on top of the, the, the other, and you see the matrix size has gotten bigger. And again, you see the universality phenomenon. Now, one of the aspects uh, the, which people might, might find su surprising is, of course, for Q, QUE, COSH, and GUE, they will all have, as you will see, completely different um, uh, eigenvalue di uh, distributions where, and the uh, den density of states or the equilibrium measures are very different. They do not, or apart from the fir fir first one, they do not follow the se semicircle law. So, uh, very different basic statistics. So, here are the three, three ensembles. GUE is uh, this one here. QUE is quartic unitary ensemble with easy mass n trace to them. So this is already with d dependent entries, and this has cosh, which is easy mass trace of cosh m. Both QUE and cosh do not follow the semicircle law. So already you're looking at very different kind, kinds of. Uh, nevertheless, you see you're going to get exactly the same fluctuations. This point, okay. So at this point, we had. Yeah, uh, it actually, it turn, turns out to be the same. They are the same. They so are the same. You don't distinguish the, the know, algorithm does not distinguish. distinguish between GOE and Absolutely. GOE. Initially, we thought that they were different, but they aren't, which itself are is are an you interesting. Are they not, or are you just. You they just are everything not? I'm saying today is numerical observation. <laughs> okay, everything I'm saying today. So uh, now, at this point, we had come to the. A uh, rather strong feeling that the phenomenon was <coughs> that we were speaking about was present in eigenvalue com computation. So then we raised the issue: is is the phenomenon going to be pre present in other standard numerical computation? Everything we did was always with absolutely standard algorithms. We weren't inventing these al algorithms uh, to for for some uh, simplifications. We just took standard algorithms. So. 
the con conjugate gra gradient algorithm, an extremely popular algorithm to solve wx equals b in the case where w is a real positive definite ma matrix. So you want to solve w equals b where w is ran random and b, uh, b is random. It's an iterative method. And at iteration k of the algorithm, an approximate solution of this is found, w, and you compute r, r, r k. And then the method halts for given epsilon when this r k is less than e epsilon, and that halting time is then recorded. Uh, here the authors consider n by n matrices A chosen from do two different positive definite ensembles E, which I'll describe in a mo mo moment, and vectors B chosen independently with IID entries. So given epsilon small and n large and W and B from some ensemble, the authors record the halting time and compute the fluctuations of the halting hul time, and the histograms are given below. So here is for we have actually epsilon here is 10 to the minus 8. You're looking at two, two ensembles, which I'm going to de describe in a moment. Here you've got the two ensembles, one on top of the other. And now you begin to see how there really is a scaling regime. The phenomenon is not at all persuasive here, but once you begin to have larger matrices, you begin to see the universality coming out. So you've got two histograms here, one on top of the other, one for E. Uh, for this choice of E and the other for the other choi choice of E. Uh, in each case, the histograms are computed using a large <coughs> number, 16,000 som uh, samples. So these are what the ensembles are. The first is the Laguerre orthogonal ensemble given by X, X tra transpose divided by M where X is an N by M matrix with IID Gaussian mean zero variance one entries. And the other is the critically scaled Bernoulli ensemble given by XXT, where X is now consists of IID Bernoulli variables taking the values plus or minus one with equal prob probability. The examples which I'm given should give you the sense we're looking at very different kind, kinds of ensembles. One's purely discrete and the other is as smooth as you could ever want. Now there's a very interesting issue, in fact, a talk completely on its own, how you choose M depending on N. If you choose N too big, like N equals two, uh, if you choose M equals two, uh, two N, you won't see, see the universality. And that's because the algorithm con converges in essentially a fi finite number of steps. If you take M equals N, then the algorithm uh, it begins to feel the finite arithmetic, in other words, fin uh, finite accuracy. And then the algorithm just goes on and on and on, doesn't stop in, 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 in finite time. There's this critical region, which looks at m should be n plus 2, 2 root n, for, will for you to have enough samples or, or enough uh, var uh, variation in, in the outcome to see real st uh, st statistics. It's a whole other sto uh, story. Time minus the expected sample average divided by the Sta uh, sample deviation. standard deviation. Sample standard deviation mm. varies from problem to problem. Is that correct? Sure, yeah, both of them vary. It's only the fluctuation. It's only the so this is what we call two component un universality. Once you know the the mean, and once you know the the rest is universal. It's a lin linearization, if you want to think of it okay. uh, that way. Yeah, yes. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here are the results for con. Doesn't doesn't x fourth have to? Be, doesn't one? X fourth. Well, I did do x to the fourth. Yeah. Okay. But uh, mm -hmm. because does not for Yeah. I'll show you examples. Is thank you for the question. Okay. So the next al algorithm is called Jim Jim Res, and this again you want to solve. Wx equals b, but now w has the form 1 plus capital X, where x is just a ran random variable. It's a different cl class of matrices. And uh, the BBIJs are chosen in independently with uniform IID entries. 
and w equals 1 plus x is almost surely not no longer po positive definite and the conjugate gradient algorithm breaks down so you use what's called Jim Riz. it's also an iterative scheme and you look at the residual rk and you stop for given any epsilon when rk is less than epsilon and you record the number of steps you need again you're not telling us what this algorithm is I guess, right? uh, I'm not it, okay. it's a standard <laughs> algorithm I don't know what okay name. okay <laughs> It stands sta standard, right? Uh, so you record this. Remember again, epsilon is the accuracy you want, n is the size, size of the matrices, a is the algorithm here, which is Jim Rez, and e are some cho choices of ensemble. Uh, so, so this is a ran this is a, as opposed to the other one. This is a random algorithm or not? No, it's not random. It's not random. Uh, the algorithm. only randomness is in the initial da data. Yeah, it's okay. completely de yeah, de so determined. The next one you're going to explain. Yeah. Random algorithm. Okay. Not. Right. So again, you're going to see the, un the universality <coughs> again. As your matrix size gets bigger and bigger, these are two, two histograms for different choices of ensemble. So you've got matrices 1 plus K capital X, and X is chosen from two different ensembles. Epsilon is 10, 10 to the minus 8. And again, we use 16,000 samples. Th these are what the ensembles look, look, look like. Uh, you, your matrices look like this. 1 plus x over root 10, where x is n, n by n iid Bernoulli variables, taking plus or minus 1. The other case is given, where uh, again, of the same form, where these are iid Gaussian, that means area and variance 1. So again, completely different kinds of ensembles. X is no longer symmetric or positive definite. It is just, uh, yeah, it's a, either a shifted gen Geneva on ensemble or it is a Bernoulli ensemble. And again, <coughs> just to give the picture again, when N and Epsilon are uh, properly large and small, then uh, we see the phenomenon beginning to come out. All right, so, so far, we'd can read... Can you go to larger, I mean, is it very expensive to go to, to larger matrix sizes, like, you know, 2,000, or is that... So, uh, no, so many of the experiments are done with matrices are of that size, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. See, course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Then, at this point, everything we've been doing has been with finite uh, algorithms from finite dimensional ma mathematics. The two most basic operations you do in, in linear algebra, solving for eigenvalues and I eigenvectors. I haven't said anything about eigenvectors here, but also <coughs> uh, the most basic problem of all is solving Ax equals b. So then we said, well, are these phenomena that is this phenomenon we're seeing just always restricted to finite dimensional prob uh, problems? So we said, okay, <coughs> what about PDEs? So we looked at the situation of solving Laplace's equation, the Dirichlet problem, in the star-shaped region omega in R2, where the boundary values are prescribed. In this case, the boundary, because it's a um, a star star shaped region the uh, the uh, uh, region itself is de described as a function of the angle so you've got r equals r r of theta and similarly f equals f of theta where theta runs from zero to two to two pi so the region is described by a period periodic function of the theta about some point and the data is given in this way we'll look at two different ensembles for the data and also for the um, for the re region itself. Now, the region why we can speak here about random regions is, of course, because R is a periodic fun uh, fun uh, function of theta, and hence we can think of it as having a random Fourier series, so we can pick the co co coefficients ran randomly. The con the boundary condition f is chosen randomly by uh, choosing f at these points. Uh, IID uniform on minus one to one. The histogram for the halting time for these computations are given below, and again, two component universality is evident. So here's your star shaped region omega. Uh, X is R cos, Y is R sine. 
So x looks like this. Let's look at regions which have a fin finite number of uh, Fourier components. And ra randomness is going to come in two, two, two forms. The xj and the yj are IID random variables taking values in minus 1 upon 2 to 1 upon 2. This ensures that r never goes through 0, right? So divide by 2, OK. The double layer potential for, for formulation of the boundary integral equa equation looks like this. So we know that every Dirichlet problem of this kind can be converted into a boundary value problem, problem on the boundary. It looks like this. But this is the normal derivative on the bound, uh, boundary. So you have to solve this equa equation on, on the boundary. So the two situations we look at are uh, Bernoulli Dirichlet ensemble, a case where x, m, and y m are Bernoulli variables, choose taking values plus or minus 1 over 2m with equal pro probability. Then there's the uniform Dirichlet ensemble, where x and y are taken uniformly in this region. One is discrete, one is con continuous. So we solve this pro pro problem by using Jim, uh, Jim Res again. OK. So we've got this integral equa equation. We write it as in the form. So you discretize it again. Discretize it again. And we write it in the form 1 plus x. So u equals f. And we discretize this problem. Yeah, well, we. Uh, after we do discretize, we get some matrix X over here, which is obtained by discretizing that integral. And we solve this using Jim, Jim Res. And then some, so the first thing that we find, now uh, wait, I've jumped over, uh, all right. So again, we find, uh, okay, the, uh, Again, we see the we have two the two choi uh, choices that I mentioned, uh, and again we find that we have this uni universality independent of uh, of the choices. Now, here we did the following thing: is that we've used Jim Res in two different situations. In the one situation, the matrix capital X there was just purely independent, either GOE or Orbin, no structure at all. The other case, we took x to be a discretization of integral. The randomness is purely coming from your choice of Fourier, uh, Fourier series. Nevertheless, and we got two histograms in each case. Then we put them one on top of the, uh, the, the other. So one at capital X is cho cho chosen with no structure, the other with is structure and randomness as well. I forget what you told us when, that, when you had, oh no. So, yeah, so, so when, you did the, when you did the unitary ensembles with the, with the different potential, you also got, you also got universal, right. independent of the these, and actually independent of the symmetry. Absolutely, sure. So this curve that you keep on showing us, yeah. which you claim is universal, Gus, I assume you've got a conjecture as to what it is. Yeah, we don't have a conjecture. <laughs> 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 Can you convert? Okay, let me. Okay, you'll see later on that it's difficult to make a, a, a conjecture. Okay. Um, okay. He's got a conjecture, but I'll catch you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll catch you somewhere. Okay. So here's putting these four histograms, one on to top of the other. So in, in other words, we're seeing the same hi histogram coming out. Now, this is a very interesting and very surprising thing, but not without pre precedent. Because if you remember what Wigner did when he, was, when he introduced ran random matrix theory, he was facing, he had this big uranium nucleus, he was firing neutrons at it, he wanted to know the distribution, something about the distribution of the resonances. And he just assumed <coughs> His basic insight was to assume that they behave like the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Again, you had a situation there where you have a structured stochastic pro pro problem. You've got a uranium nu nucleus, which has structure, but nevertheless has many degrees of freedom, and somehow you think of that as a structured random system. Nevertheless, a structured random system is modeled by a purely random system with no, no structure. It's exactly the same phenomenon that you're seeing here. 
And this was a very so surprising. And he uh, had a surmise, which was wrong, so maybe, maybe. you should be careful. OK, <laughs> OK. Make some simplistic guess yeah. Uh, so that tells us that you should be very careful before you say something is Gaussian. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I will have an answer in cases where I can. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. So okay. then the next situation we looked at was that all the cases we were looking at were really dynamical systems with random initial data. What happens if the algorithm is genuinely stochastic? So then we looked at the genetic al algorithm. So. You it, tell us what that is? I'm going to tell you in, in great I detail. I, I don't really know what it is. Okay. So the genetic algorithm is, I would say, one of the re most remarkable things I've ever seen. Uh, I've never seen anything like not just the algorithm itself, but the, the fact that it actually works. That is, nobody knows why it works, and nobody, there are no theor uh, theorems uh, apart from some spe special cases which actually pro proves that it works. But you can see what the basic idea is. Suppose you've got some function that you want to minimize. And the function depends on many, many variables, a thousand. And you're trying to minimize it. The chances are very likely that you're going to be caught in some local minimum. And any algorithm you have is going to keep you there. And so you've got to get away from that. And what the algorithm does is it jerks you around, all, all around in a very uh, in a way which doesn't seem to have any logic to it. So let me tell you what the algorithm is. So I want to, I have a function of several variables. Is it? It could be, I mean, it's highly non It's, yeah, highly non and typically, and this is used great, greatly in the fi financial I industry, where they're trying to use the data they have, oh, up, yeah. uh, yeah, they're trying to oh, choose yeah. the data which they have to today, which depends on many, many variables to make some prediction about the very near, near future. So they use this algorithm. <coughs> Is it so using uh, uh, things like spin glasses, moon field spin glasses? I believe it is, yeah. yeah. So uh, the algorithm, uh, so uh, for this particular problem we, we looked at, is very well known. Uh, it's to compute the Fekata points. Uh, so P, uh, P star are the unique global minus, uh, min minimizers of this objective fun uh, function. So V is some function which grows rapidly as. So this is an example. Of what you're going to look at. It's the only example which we we okay. look at. Okay. Okay, it's because. Um, so V is some cho choice of fun function which grow grows rapidly. The minimizers are the factor points, and as well known, if you look at the counting measure associated with so, so such points, it converges the equilibrium measure, which plays a key role in the asymptotic theory of orthogonal polynomials or in ran random matrix theory. <coughs> so genetic algorithms, I'm going to say more, more about the cho choice of V, and I'll get back to your question. Uh, genetic algorithms are particularly useful for large-scale optimization problems that occur, for example, in the financial industry. They have two basic components, mutation and crossover, which I'm going to explain. This is the, explana <coughs> the explanation of why one has a name like a genetic al al uh, algorithm. So how does it work? So what's going, going to happen is that you're going to move along and at each point, you're going to make a choice whether you're going to do the step of mu mutation or you're going to take or do the pr pr procedure of cro crossover. And I'll explain wh what they are. So, fix a distribution D. So, we're going to see universality with respect to D. Draw an initial po uh, population. Okay. So, remember. Uh, over here, uh, this end should be capital. This end should be little n. I'm con uh, confusing them, right? Uh, wait. So each no. Wait. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this should be cap uh, capital N. Okay. This should be a capital N. So think about it like this. Let me do it over here. So you're going to take an 
initial pump, uh, population. Each of these are of size capital N. And you're going to take here little n equals 40 different vectors, each of size capital N. And those are scalars? Each entry here is a scalar. Okay. They are, they are They're all real numbers. Okay, and initially you say, you t oh, sorry, they're one, 100 vectors here. And how does n compared to 100? I mean, is n much larger than 100? You'll, you'll, you'll see, capital N. Then, and n should be large. In fact, it hasn't got to be that large to begin to see, see the phenomenon. Now, each of these entries here are chosen IID to, 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 to start with. They're IID uniform from minus four, uh, 4 to 4. Now, the algorithm consists of a map, F sub D, which will take us from one collection of 100, n by n, uh, 100 vectors of size n to a new collection of 100 vectors of size capital N. Well, have a new distribution then? Or is it Same distribution. Well, you, you start off. Yeah, but will your distribution evolve? D. No. no. D, D is evolve. fixed. Yeah, but you will, from one example to the next, you're going to have different Ds. Pick a D, and we're going to make a cal calculation. Okay. okay, then we're going to make, pick a different D and make the same cal calculation. The different, the different D will depend on what you got from the first no. D? No. Okay, a different D. A different D, okay. and okay. Um, for these different Ds, we hope to see uni universality. Okay. So the big thing we have to do is to understand how uh, we update from such a set of one 100 vectors of size capital to a new set of one 100 vectors of size n. So you do one of two procedures. The one is mu mutation. So just to jump, jump ahead for, uh, for a moment, you just have a coin there. And at step 50, say, you flip the coin, and the coin is heads, you do mu mutation. You flip the coin, you get tails, you do crossover. Then you do the next step. So what is mu mutation? You've got a, oh, what am I doing? What have I got there? How, how do I get rid of that on the left there? How, get rid, can I get rid of that on the left? Yeah, how did I do that? Okay, so, all right. So, here we've got uh, 100 vectors, each of size, and pick one of them. So you pick the first one. Then you draw n1 numbers, x1 to xn1, from your basic distribution D, and you perturb the first n1 elements of your, ve your, n, your, your vector by these xi's. So you've picked this D, and you take the first n, n1 n entries, and you perturb it by some randomly chosen number from D. Then you draw n minus n2 IID numbers from D, and you per 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 perturb the last n minus n2 entries of P in this way. Get a new, ma a new entry here. Finally, you draw n1 minus n2 num numbers, and you use them to perturb the entries from I to uh, from uh, through from N1 star, from the middle to the other part of the middle. So what you've done is you've picked this guy and you've perturbed the first N1 guys randomly, you've perturbed the last N minus N2 guys, and you've perturbed the guy and guys in the middle. That step is known as mutation. The next step is crossover. You pick two guys from here maybe the first one and the second one. You take two numbers, n1 and n2, randomly, in independently from 1 up to n. And what you do is you replace the n1th element of p by the n2th element of q, of uh, should be q, and you add in some per perturbation with a sample of d. 
So you take, for example, if we had the first row and the se second row, and we take one, one element here, and we replace it with the n, so the n one element here, you replace with the n two element here, and you perturb. And then you do a similar thing for q. You replace the n one element of q by the n two element, this would be of p over here, and perturb it additively again. So what have you got? So each step, if you're at, at, step, at step 50, you go to step 51 by flipping a coin. And if your co coin come, uh, comes out heads, you're going to do mu mu mutation. If it comes out tails, you're going to do crossover. And then, so what do you have? If you sta started with P over here, and you did mu mutation, you would have P plus these three new vectors which you have crea and created. If you did well, cross... expanding the size of your you system. Initially, initially. And then after cro crossover, we would have your original P with two entries added in, obtained by this cro uh, crossing over. And your map from your initial set of 100 vectors of size n, you get a new set of 100 vectors of size n, by doing the following, you choose the 100 pi's from the 103 here or the 102 here, which yield the smallest values of the function you want to minimize. So you're at a particular step p. You do a mu mutation, say. You get 103 three, three vectors. From those 103, you pick the 100, which have the smallest value of hp. So you go back to something of that. Now, quite remarkably, this extraordinary algorithm really works and really con uh, converges. So we run it until the minimum of this minus the infimum is less than epsilon. And we look at two situations, and this is what you were asking. Uh, in the one case, we take v equals x squared. In the other take case, we take v equals x to the fourth minus 3x three, uh, three squared. Here, the, um, the equilibrium measures support on one, one interval. Here, it supports on two, two, uh, two intervals. These are different prom uh, pro pro problems, and each will give rise to its own universality class. That's, uh, that's the point. And this is what you see. I found this absolutely extra extraordinary, the fact that this algorithm not only works, so what you're looking at, both of these pictures they have for v equals x squared. And here we check two different choices of d, our basic uh, distribution. One is uniform on minus 1 over 10 n to plus 1 over 10. The other is um, just taking the n values with plus or minus. And again, discrete versus um, un uniform distribution. So in this picture, v, v is x squared. And the size n, capital N here, is just 10. And here it goes, guys. And already when n is just 40, it looks pretty good. Here you've got v is equal to x to the fourth minus 3x three, three squared. And again, you see, so you see very clearly these are different distributions. Nevertheless, for each cho choice of v, you have universality. So that would be a v dependent. It's a different algorithm, a different algorithm. You, choose, you change, change your al algorithm, you're in a but different universal. Mean, is, it because, is it because there are two intervals, or is it not? I mean, I mean no, it's just two different, uh, different examples. But how do you know, can I ask you, I mean, getting back to this phonetic, which I still don't really quite understand, yeah. it took me a while to absorb it, but how do you know what distribution to take? We just pick one. Okay. But, I mean, there must be. A, I would think you'd be searching for a good distribution. That this okay. Out. So let me, let me turn to turn the question around. We're trying to posit the idea yeah. that the universality is so strong mm. that as long as you're doing something reasonable, you're going to see it. Yeah. yeah okay, uh, from a practical point of view. So this is a little bit off, yeah, off of your, your, your okay. theme. But but if I'm trying to do so, I'm trying to minimize mm. something. There must, your, your distribution is somehow going to be, 
is going to be the answer to your problem, right? I mean, no, that uh, distribution is not the answer. Not, not That's yet. just how you operate the the uh, the I mean, algorithm. As I do this, this distribu I mean, when I, get, when I start going through this procedure, doesn't my distribution change? No. That I use D. Yes. So here, yeah. D here is um, uh, one, say, this is Bernoulli, yeah, okay. and this here is uniform. I understand. So, but I'm, I'm, so if I'm not looking at fluctuation, I'm just asking for rapid algorithms, it yeah. would make a difference, right? Which it will which make a I difference. Chose. It will make a difference. How, how would you know how to choose it, or don't you know? Uh, we don't, don't know. So we are just saying that once you know, the mean I, I, and I, once I, 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 point. I, yeah. I was asking really a different and question. It's a different question, but you'll you'll see see in the, in the next week how these things okay. do come uh, come together in a way. So, uh, all right, uh, all right. So, uh, okay, all right. So let me go. All right, all right. So uh, we found this absolutely. Remarkable, right? That this very, very loose al algorithm, and all you're doing when you got to 103 vectors, you're just throwing three, three out in such a way to. I mean, nevertheless, it converges in computable time, and you see the universal. It really shows how powerful this algorithm is. And okay, uh, there are theorems, that, for example, for these vector points, that tell you how rapidly. How rapidly it converges, or, or not? Uh, so, uh, of course, um, depending upon something. It, it, so, uh, you've got bounds. You've got some bounds, but they're not in term, 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 terms of uh, the, this algorithm. Definitely not this. Yeah, algorithm. No, okay. Okay. So, at at this point, things get a little bit spe speculative, right? So we said over here. We've seen this phen uh, phenomenon in finite dimensional problems, infinite dimensional problems, and purely stochastic algorithms. So we feel, we feel at this point that there's a strong argument to be made for the case of universality in com computation. Then we pick up a line of new neuroscientists who say they have a model for the brain, right, which says that it's like a big computer <laughs> with software and hardware. So if that is a story, we should be able to see this phenomenon of universality in human brains, right? The way they compute. So this was a thought. We didn't know how to go, go about it. But then we found uh, some recent work, relatively recent, who is a colleague of mine. He wasn't a colleague at the point this was done, and a psychologist at, Cor uh, at um, Minnesota. And what they did was the following. They got okay. So forty six participants, and each pa participant was shown 200 pictures. So what did these pictures con consist of? Each had a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, there were black disks, finite number of black disks. On the right-hand side were black disks. And they had area more or less the same. So each one was shown 200 such pictures. What they had to do was decide which side, left or right, had larger area, covered larger area. And what was recorded was the time it took them to make a decision. That's what was recorded. Then, See which one was bigger or which, uh, whether they were correct or not didn't matter. Just how long did it take them to make a, de a decision? And what came came out of it is that 
you found that the histogram for the de decision process was, in most ca ca cases, I think something like 39 out of the 45, was the same histogram. For each individual? Each individual had the same histogram. And so in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the sense of fluctuations, of course. In terms of fluctuations. So for each one, you get 200 numbers. And then you can compute the fluctuations for each person, and you get a, a, a histogram. And in most of the case, overwhelmingly the most, that you got the same histogram. More, moreover, Bakhtin and Kokara came up with a model, which I'll describe in a moment, a st statistical mechanical model, which predicted that exact same histogram. So what they did is looked at something which I'm going to give words which I don't really know what they mean, but I think they're correct. It's, is, so the model is uh, Glauber dynamics on this hypercube with microscopic approximation of a drift diffusion process. So your state is given by n variable, a, a, a vector of n plus or minus ones. <coughs> the state of the system t uh, is given in this way. So each one of these at time t is plus or minus one. The transition probabilities are given through this expression. The prob prob probability that xi at t plus delta t is not equal to xi given that you're at state x <coughs> is cix delta t, and this is called the flip intensity. The observable con considered is just the sum of these quant quantities. You go divide by one, uh, 1 over n, and the initial state of the system has chosen that this variable here is zero, a state with no a priori bias. So why? Bakhtin and Corel thought that this, uh, this should work is that think about it. You're looking at this, these two, two pictures and you say, ah, this looks bigger than that. Then you look again, you make a second decision. Uh, no, you say, maybe this one looks bigger than that. So each time along the way, you try to evaluate, you say this, this. Eventually, there's a pre preponderance of the right over the left at which point you make your de decision. So that's the idea. You run the algorithm until you get the first time for which this average is bigger than some given epsilon. Uh, just a few, few more details. Let me just go about a little bit more, more quickly. Time del uh, delta t is chosen as an exponential ra random variable with this mean. See as this, uh, the flip, the flip in intensity. And then which of these X size is going to flip is given according to this standard pro procedure. And so you have this. If time s is less than the flip, uh, flip time, everything stays, stays the same. But if you're at the flip, uh, flip time, all the X size except xj stay the same, and just the xj just flips. Here you can see. So what uh, Bachten and Cor Corel did was make a choice of flip inten intensity. And what we wanted to do was to say, look, the chances of them, just think, think about it. They're able to predict what these 39 or 40, uh, 40 people would do. The chances of them having the right flip inten intensity are very small. So the only way out of it is that there is universality. <laughs> and that's what we found where we put in different possible flip, flip intensities. This here is one particular run. You see, you run it up to time t. You've got epsilon equals 0.5. So when t is a little more than 4, you find that m hits this point, And this is when the person makes a decision. So here is the histogram. So it really doesn't matter. The, what you learn, learn from this pi picture is it doesn't matter. Uh, what flip, rate, uh, flip intensity is. Uh, yeah. so, okay. so what you have here, this is the, to lay out this uh, situation, you have universality within whatever neural structure is going on in pe pe people's brain. Secondly, it's the same universality that's in the model of Buckton and Corel. Thir thirdly, the model of Buckton and Corel itself has its own un universality clause. Now, there's one more aspect to it. If you go to Google, for, uh, for example, and you take 3,000 words in English, same, 
and you can get from Google the time it takes to get and get the, to to get an answer. You'll find you the distribution mm -hmm. or, or, or just it, look it for it to appear. Okay, you click the, the and it, uh, you you get get an answer, and you look at the fluctuations of the time over the 300. You see it's exactly the same distribution. If you take 3,000 Turkish words, again you get exactly the same distribution. So there's a universality <laughs> between what's going on in your mind and my my, my mind, and when we make the de decision, bro, in this spin flip model of um, Bakhtin and Corral and in the universality of that, the, uh, that pro process, and in what Google does. So it's something to think about. Okay, I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much.